You may be seated, you may be seated. As the worship team was singing that song, I was thinking about Lamentations 3.23 when it was talking, they were talking about the faithfulness of God. There's a verse in there that says that he's so faithful that his mercies are new every single morning. Do you realize this morning when you woke up, you woke up to brand spanking new mercy. And the, the only people that can rejoice over that are, are people that know that they're guilty for a lot. And if you haven't been forgiven for a lot, you have a license to be quiet today. But if you've been forgiven for something, you should thank God for his mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a line in that song that says his faithfulness, he's faithful in every season. And I don't know what season you walked in here with. I, I know how it is. You know, there are some times where you're, you, you're dragging, right? You're not, you know, you're not. You're not in a season that's, that feels bountiful and plentiful, but nevertheless, even in that season, God deserves our praise because he's faithful. I love that part. He's faithful in every single season. There's never a moment he's not worthy of the praise and adoration. Well, it's good to be in the house of God with you guys. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Do me a favor. Can y'all just like shake your arms off? I don't know if the rain or something is kind of tight in here. I want us to wake up a little bit. Look at somebody and just say, I'm happy to see you, but wake up. Come on, look at somebody else that looks sleepy and say, I know you had a long week, long night, but wake up. I'm serious, man. I'm serious, y'all. I am glad to be alive. Like I got, I got blood flowing through my veins this morning. My heart is beating and I'm not telling it to beat. Y'all missed that. My heart's beating and I'm not telling it to be. My lungs are working. I'm able to breathe this morning. And I'm just, I'm so, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful um, for the Lord and his continued faithfulness to us. My dad would say, I'm glad to be in the land of the living. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad to just, just be alive today. Um, it's time for the word of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it's time for the word of God. Do me a favor, grab your Bibles. Go to the third book of the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is where we're going to hang out. Just a quick shout out to Caleb that preached last week. And man, come on, let's thank God for... It ain't easy, y'all. It ain't easy. It's a lot of weight that goes to it. And um, he faithfully walk, walked us through Mark chapter 2. And shout out to Yolanda and Bible study on Wednesday. She is, she is the, like, the best kept secret, like legit, just so, so, so faithful. And the way she worked through Acts chapter four and called us to a different level of commitment to a communal prayer. Of course, you can pray isolated, but communal prayer and just showed us some things that, that were just profound. I'm actually, she, she put the ball on, on the tee ball for me today. So I'm actually going to be able to jump right off of where she was on Wednesday when she was in Leviticus uh, but I'm, I'm really grateful. And my prayer has been since Wednesday to, that God would just continue to stir up the gifts. There's more people in this in this room and that are online that have the gift of teaching and the gift of leadership. And I'm just grateful, man, for everybody that brings their giftings to the church, our prayer team, our welcome teams. You got new people, brothers jumping on the welcome team. And beloved, I heard you had an amazing event yesterday. <laughs> amen. Amen. And um children's ministry your kids are upstairs and you parents y'all should say man you got a bit of a break i'm serious our social media team our social media team just just continues to just continue to kill it i love seeing johan yesterday on social media yesterday y'all y'all saw the the get ready with me with johan and shakira it's uh it was it's just really good to be a part of a church that everybody brings all of their giftings uh to the to the church all right i'm talking too much leviticus <laughs> Leviticus. We're going to be in Leviticus 10. And do me a favor, put your, your finger also. Well, you guys are young. Y'all don't got Bibles. Devices. Hey, come on now. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Scroll to Leviticus 16 and Leviticus chapter 10. And uh, all right, I mean, we can do it if y'all want to. Who got the physical copies? All right. All right. It's 10 of us. We got our phones. It's all good. I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm grateful to live in a, in a tech age. All right, let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Um, and I'm going to jump in. 
We're in Luke, we're, Luke, we're in Leviticus 10. I'm going to start there. So just kind of bounce with me. Pick me up in verse one. Are y'all there? All right. Verse one says this. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, a.k.a. Aaron. <laughs> each, <laughs> y'all saw that video too? That's old. Each, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid an incense on it and offered an unauthorized fire. If you're looking from a different translation, it might say a strange fire before the Lord, which had not been commanded of them. A fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord says among those who are, please pay attention to these two words, near me. Somebody say near me. I will be sanctified and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. We'll stop there. We'll get to Leviticus 16 in a second. Let's, let's pray. Before we do, I want to preach today from the topic entitled the cost of our sin. The cost of our sin. Let's look to the Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, because you are good and merciful and gracious to us. An extension of your mercy is the fact that you've allowed us to not just make it to today, but weather through traffic and you kept us from danger, seen and unseen. And you brought us here to this place. And Lord, we arrive with grateful hearts. We pray, oh God, that we would, as we open up your word, may we not approach your word casually today. May this not be the moment where we check out. May we give you this time to hear from you. Because your word tells us that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so this morning we are praying that you would illuminate those areas, those dark areas, sharpen us and encourage us and correct us and all of the things that your word says it does. It's in the name of Jesus we give glory. Somebody say amen. The cost of our sin. Hey, real quick, listen, if y'all do me a favor, don't check out today. It's, um, it's Leviticus, so I get it. But y'all do me a favor. Y'all don't, y'all don't check out. If you, if you go on your phone and go on TikTok, I pray your thumbs would cramp up and, <laughs> and your phone would just blow up. But seriously, don't check out. It's, I got to do a little work. But um, in full transparency, this is, this is my first time ever actually preaching from the book of Leviticus. It's a, it's a book that I, I love and, and enjoy now. Uh, but if I, can, if I can be honest, I did not like this book when I first gave my life to the Lord. And I was, it was actually right before I gave my life to the Lord, I started to read scripture. And I, Leviticus just wasn't, it just, just wasn't it for me. I, I'm, I'm kind of, the way my mind is wired, I love the narratives, right? I love Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I love Ezra, reads as a, as a narrative. I love the book of Nehemiah. You get to see the, you get to see a story, right? I, I get that. You can make a good movie out of the narratives. But God calls us to read more than just the narratives. I love the Psalms, especially when you get to the 100s. It's something anointed about Psalm 100 and up. Now, I ain't saying the rest of it ain't, ain't, ain't inspired by the Lord. I'm just saying he put a little extra oil on them hundreds and ups. What about the epistles? The epistles, I don't know if you love the epistles or not. Um, it, they grew on me. And, and as I began to feel a calling toward pastoral ministry, um, the epistles became a warm blanket. It is where you can shape doctrine. It is where you can preserve the church uh, uh, with doctrine. It is, it is where you can fight against False teachers, I think that the epistles, the Pauline epistles, the, 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 the Peter's letters, they, they, they do something for our theology and our doctrine. But Leviticus, just, just for me, you know, wasn't it, you know, it, it's, it, when I did, used to do a, a, a one-year Bible reading plan when I, when I first started to read the Bible, and I did a one-year Bible plan, a lot of my Bible plans died in Leviticus. Is that anybody else's story? I mean, I, I don't know what it, you start out real good in Genesis. Oh God, you get to the Exodus and you get that, that, that narrative of the, of the Exodus experience, but you get to Leviticus and it just feels like everything slows down. You ever try to run in your dream? You know that feeling when you run in and it's like, I can't move. Like, that's what I feel like when, when you know, sometimes when you read, when you read through Leviticus, when I was a kid, I, I grew up on the Jersey shore um, and my friends and I would race from the boardwalk all the way down to the water and, you know. We would run all the way into the water. And you, you know, you start out running as best you can on that, you know, that, that unstable surface of a sand. You start out running real well, but then you hit the water and everything. That's what my one-year Bible plan was. It was Genesis, Exodus, and it's like, it's like everything, everything just like slows down. Anybody else Bible play and died in Leviticus? I'm just curious to know if that's the rule. Oh, y'all, y'all being deep. You're lying. Your, your Bible plan died. 
in Leviticus. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a book that uh, is inspired by the Lord. The way the scripture says it is all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for reproof and corrections and instructions and righteousness. So we get something out of Leviticus, but there's just a lot, even the name. Can we be honest? Like Exodus has vibrata. Exodus experience taking you from Egypt to the promised land. It's like, yo, that's the Romans, the great city of Rome. That got, that got some ethos to it. Leviticus? It's, it sounds like, like a rash. Like, yo, bro, you got diagnosed with the Leviticus. It just doesn't, it doesn't sound right. But he, here's the, the truth is, we really don't like Leviticus because it seems random. It, it, seems, it seems ancient. I mean, you're giving us dietary laws and rules and regulations. You're talking about attire. You're giving these archaic religious rituals. And, and it's just so many things that seem disjointed from the rest of Scripture. Let me give you an example. Leviticus 11, 20 and 23 talks about how eating locusts is good, but eating shrimp is bad. That's in your Bibles. In fact, let me read this to you because I got quiet. All winged insects that go on all fours are, det- are detestable to you. Yet among the winged insect that goes on all fours, you may eat those that have joint legs above their feet. I'm already like bugs and feet. That just sound weird. And God is like, go oh, eat that though. That's, that's crickets. Eat, eat the locusts. That's all good. What about sideburns? Leviticus 19, 17. God loves sideburns. And, and, and ladies, I think that includes those, the baby hairs that you wave down here. Yeah, that, you're in the house. God loves it. Wave those babies down. It's all good. But, bro, we laughing. But, you know, in that same scripture, it says, don't cut your beard. I'm looking around the room. Yeah. You shaved it a little bit off, right? It said, he said all of it. The, then you're in sin. The scripture says, do not cut the edges of your beard. What about Leviticus 19, 28? Apparently, tattoos are out. What about Leviticus 20, verse 19? Parents, you should resonate with this one. Back talking from your children can get them stoned. In fact, we're teaching that to your kids upstairs. Right? No, I'm kidding. We're not. We're not teaching that. But you need to memorize that one. Back talking to your parents in the Old Testament, Leviticus can actually get you stoned. What about clothing? Leviticus 19, 19 says absolutely no clothing that has mixed fabrics. So imagine that today, if you came today with uh, floral polyester pants and you got a, a striped nylon shirt on, you're in sin. And apparently for two reasons. <laughs> One's biblical and the other one, you're just doing too much. It's just, it's a lot. I, I, listen, I know you thrift. I got you. But it was just a lot. Floral polyester, paisal, n- nylon, it's just it's together. It comes, doesn't work. But. Even though it seems disjointed, it seems all over the place, and it, you know, it, it, it seems like it, there's nothing we can really grab from it, I want to encourage you, and I honestly, preaching from Leviticus today should incur in a Bible study that, that was in Leviticus that was talking about the temple. What, what, I, what I want to encourage us to do is not run away from scriptures that seemingly are confusing. Go on the sanctifying journey of working through it, and don't just read it, actually study it because there's so much in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus, it, yeah, it has a bunch of laws. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. 251 of those laws are, are based in Leviticus. You, and, and then you got all types of laws, right? There's, there's, there's ceremonial laws, which are, the, which are the regulations about cleansliness and the sacrificial system. Then there's civil laws, which are about how to govern a nation, how, to, how, to, how do you handle punishment and crime. Then there are, there, then there are, are, are moral laws, which are the laws that God declares and, and sees as moral. That's the, the Ten Commandments, right? Don't kill nobody. Don't steal. There are all types of laws in the Old Testament and specifically in Leviticus. And so skimming over it real quick won't serve you well in your spiritual sanctification and your growth, but sitting in it for a little bit, and that's what we're going to do today, primarily because Jesus studied Leviticus. He didn't only quote Leviticus multiple times, but here's what Jesus says about the law. He says the law was perfect. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. That's the first thing he says. The second thing he says about it is, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came that the law might be fulfilled. 
I don't know if you know what that means, but Jesus is basically saying, I know you're reading these ancient things and the reason you can come in here with, you know, with your polyester and your nylon on and you got your sideburns and the finger, the reason it's all good is because watch what Jesus says, because I didn't come to do away with the law, but I fulfilled the law. The reason we're not sacrificing animals, ain't nobody in here with pigeons and we ain't cutting goats throats in this room is because Jesus has already bled out and somebody should say his blood was good. It was good. So G Jesus says, look, man, not only did I read the law, but it was perfect. Not only was it perfect, but I, I didn't come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. And Jesus is like, yo, listen, I, I didn't just study Leviticus. I am Leviticus. I didn't just study the law. I am the law. And if you understand that differently, you'll read Leviticus just with a little bit more, more hope. So let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it. What you're going to see today, but you'll also see if you read the rest of Leviticus, is three things. God's holiness. Somebody say God's holiness. Our transgression. Somebody say our transgression. And our need for a savior. Somebody say our need for a savior. Now, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted as we read, especially, I mean, we're reading about Nadab and Abihu. Y'all are like, who, who are these people? And you're going to be tempted to say, this has no relevance for me, but do not check out. It does. Here's the first point I have. It's going to pop up on the screen. Our sin is much worse than we could ever imagine. Pick me back up in verse number one. It says, now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, we're in chapter 10, each took a census and put fire in it and laid the incense on, laid the incense on it and offered an unauthorized fire before the Lord, which had not been commanded of them. God didn't ask him for it. Verse two, and the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Go to chapter 16 real quick. I'm just going to, y'all catch up when, when you get there. Chapter 16, verse one says this, and the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of his two sons, the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord, there's that word again that was in chapter 10, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside of the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. I don't know if you're picking this up, but chapter 10, the Bible says that these two uh, young men, Nadab and Abihu, they, they offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. Now on the surface, I'm sitting there going, why is that bad? It seems, it seems like, a good, like I want to be sacrificial to the Lord. I want to honor God with everything that I, that I have. So what, why is this a bad thing? But this is why I told you to pay attention to the word drew near in chapter 10. And then it's repeated again in chapter 16. In other words, these men weren't just consumed because they offered God an unauthorized fire. They were also consumed because sinful man moseyed into the presence of a holy God. They drew near and they didn't realize how dirty they were. Now, I know I'm talking to somebody that's in the room because many of us are very casual in our worship. But you have to understand that you could not just walk into the presence of God. Thank God for the cross that gives you and I access to not just come into the presence of God. But Hebrews 12, Timmy says, come boldly. I consider you can come boldly before the throne of God. In the text, they just walked in and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and they dropped dead. Now, Yolanda did an amazing job on Wednesday. You should go back and watch it if you haven't watched the Bible study. But she talked about the temple. And, and you know, there, there was so, there's, man, I don't think we can fathom, even if you've been there, I don't think we can fathom the temple. The temple was broken into to four different sections and they were all partitioned off. The furthest outer section was the, the court of the Gentiles, probably where Jesus would have turned the tables over. And then the next court after that was the court of women. And then the next court after that, closest to the middle, would have been the court of Israel. And then the innermost court was called the holiest place. We learned on Wednesday that it's also called the holies of it was the holies of holy inside of the holies of holies. What was this was this, this this box that represented the visible manifestation of the presence of God. The box was called the what? Y'all going to preach with me. It's called the what? The Ark of the Covenant. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was a few items. They, they meant something to the Lord. There was a gold jar of manna in, inside. There was Aaron's staff was inside of the Ark. And then there were two uh, stone tablets 
which, which represented the, or, or they, they were the, uh, the Ten Commandments. On top of this box, we learned on Wednesday, was this thing called the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat is dope because the mercy seat has these two cherubims on the side. Now, I'm going to tell you why that becomes important, but let your boy set this up a little bit more. So inside of the holies, holies, nobody would have ever seen it except for one person one time a year. Because all of Israel wasn't just allowed to come inside. We learned on Wednesday that it was dark inside, that it would have been, it would have been smoky when the priest went in there. And, and the priest would have tiptoed in there because you can't just walk up in there. Even the preparation the week before, the, the, the history shows me that the high priest would have been secluded and isolated from the rest of Israel so that he didn't become uh, tainted with anything unclean. He, they would have brought him clean food. He would have gone through ceremonial washings all week. The night before, he would have stayed up all night praying. I don't know if this sounds like Jesus to y'all or not, but he would have stayed up all night praying and, 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 and consecrating himself. The next morning on Yom Kippur, the Bible says that he would have put on all an all white linen, which represent impurity, and he would have got in there, did his sacrifice, splattered that blood, and got out. And the reason he would have got out so fast is because if you just hang out in the presence of God, you will be consumed like a bayou and, and Nadab. Now, here's the thing: I, I hope you're picking up as we're kind of laying this foundation of uh, of this of this time. I hope you're picking up how a holy God don't just dwell with unholy people. I hope you're picking up that the righteous don't just dwell with the unrighteous, that the clean doesn't dwell with the unclean, that the pure doesn't dwell with the unpure. Even think about to get into the holies of holies. We learned on Wednesday that there would have been a curtain called a veil, and that veil wasn't like that little curtain we have here. It would have been four inches thick, which makes it dope. Imagine when Jesus died and the Bible says that the veil was torn in two, but it gives us detail. Jair, I didn't know you were here. From top to bottom, that it was torn, signifying that we no longer have to get to the presence of God through the holies of holies. We now get to the presence of God through the work of Jesus Christ. I hope you're hearing this gospel. So one time a year, the priest would clean himself up. He would get into the presence of God and he would make a sacrifice on behalf of the people of Israel. And here's what I, I, I want to suggest to you today, that there's, it is impossible this is why I say we are dirtier than we think. We're more sinful than we think. But you, a sinner, gets to get let into the presence of God because of Jesus. So what happens without Jesus and you're standing in the presence of God? Well, sin has to be dealt with. But the reason we can stand before God with pointing to Jesus as our sacrifice is because Jesus has already absorbed the sin. Listen, the gospel should always be preached, y'all. Don't let this message become common to you. And here's the thing about, you know, about bloodshed. That's what God requires to appease his wrath. We learned on Wednesday that blood should never be looked at as death, but blood should be looked at as life. Because it's life for a life. It is the only thing that, 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 uh, that, that, that satisfies God's wrath. Think back in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve fell. God had to perform the first sacrifice, give them the skin. But the bloodshed was because Jesus could not dwell with Adam and Eve and their disobedience unless he shed the blood of an animal. So the scripture today says that these two men walk in to the presence of God, and they, they perform a sacrifice that was unauthorized. It was strange to the Lord. And then chapter 16, God is like, yo, Moses, go tell your brother Aaron, my spirit, I'm about to dwell on top of the mercy seat. So, so Aaron better not come in here because if Aaron gets in here while my presence is sitting in here, I'm going, the same fate that awaited his sons is the same fate that awaits him. I, I want y'all to understand that, that you know, I, I know we don't preach about hell a lot, but the same fate that awaited a, 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 a Nadab and a Bayou is the same fate that awaits those in the room that don't know Jesus. And I know we think, oh, you know, the wrath of God, like that was for the Old Testament. No, there, the Bible says, in, uh, and I know we love John 3, 16, but keep reading. The Bible says the wrath remains for those who don't trust in Jesus Christ. And so if you're in this room going, I, I hear you, Pastor B, but I'm not, really, like, I'm not really a sinner like that. I'm a good person. Well, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned 
So Leviticus today is talking to every single person in the room and every single person that is hanging out with us online. And this is also why we should never look down on people's sin. What I mean by that is, you know how you, you, know, you hear something about somebody, you know, oh, that was gross. But you're gross. And I don't think we realize that, that we all fall short. It's like, it's like trying to swim to, from New York, go start in the Hudson, and swim, you won't make it out the Hudson, but start in the Hudson and swim all the way to London. That's about 3,500 miles. Now, listen, I'm going to be gracious to myself. At best, I'll give you a mile. And then I'm going to drown. But if Michael Phelps was right next to me and he swam also, I'm probably, I'm sure he'll probably make it a little bit further. Let's give him 50 miles. But did we both not fall short? We both drowned. I drowned one mile in. He drowned 50 miles in. Neither one of us made it to London. He's 34, uh, 3,400 feet short of making it to where he's, we all fall short. And so we all need grace. We all need Jesus. We all, we all need mercy. We all need to be pleading with God. God, I know I did it. I know you saw it. But Lord, please forgive me. And so the Bible says here that the standard in which Jesus requires to be in his presence is perfection, which is why Jesus was acceptable. It's the only reason Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable, because Jesus never sinned, because he never fell short, because he reached the mark, and that his Oh, God, he's so dope because he then turned around and then gave you the righteousness as though you live like Jesus. This is the gospel of Christ. And then he stood on the cross condemned, even though he didn't sin, but he stood on the cross as a substitute for you. Unstained, unblemished, never fail. The Bible says no deceit was even found in his mouth, but yet... He's given us that righteousness. It is called positional sanctification. Y'all stay with me. Positional sanctification that God looks at you and can say the words holy to you. You get the words holy before you. Well done. Come on in. But you know you ain't holy. I know I'm not holy. What I, what I, what I deserve is what Nadab and Abihu got. But what I got ooh, is what Israel gets. What does Israel get? Somebody else to get in there and make that sacrifice. And they get to walk. They get to walk free. I thought that would hit a little different. (laughs) Our sin is much worse than we can imagine. Now, if I stop there, you're going to walk out depressed. I have to tell you that the opposite is true as well. Yes, our sin is much more worse than we can imagine. But God's grace is even greater than we could ever dream of. Look at verse number seven. Look at verse seven in in chapter 16. It says, then he shall take two goats. Somebody say two goats. And set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats. One lot of the Lord, one lot for the Lord. And the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell before the Lord and use it as a sin offering. So therefore, one of them is being sacrificed. But watch the second one here. In verse number 10, it says, but the goat, it says, but the goat on which the lot fell for for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord that he may be, I love this, sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Now, let me first just deal with Azazel, and I'll get this out the way real quick. This is the only time Azazel's name occurs in Scripture. We do, we're very uncertain if it's a location or an actual demon. We, we don't know, but here's the thing. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Azazel is not the focus of the text. The focus of the text is that Aaron calls for two goats. And why is he calling for two goats? Because one of them, blood is what appeases God, so I got to sacrifice one of them. So he's going to spin a lot and the lot's going to fall on one of them. And the one of them that the lot falls on, the Bible says that he's going to take it and he's going to sacrifice it before the Lord, atoning for Israel's sin. But then he's going to take the second one. Oh, God, the second one. He puts his hand on it and he prays that God transfers all of Israel's wickedness and disobedience and rebellion and sin. And he prays that it goes on the other goat and then he smacks it and it runs into the wilderness never to be seen again. Now, I love this. I love this because what this shows me is that there are two things going on in your life as it relates to the cross. Because one goat is a sacrifice. It represents justification. It is the sinner's debt being paid. 
You and I are forgiven because of the sacrifice. But the other goat represents that not only are you forgiven, but your sins have been forgotten. He sends it away. And when he sends it away, he sends it away with all of their yearly sins. Now, I got to put Bible here because y'all got quiet on me. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, far as removed, God has removed transgression from us. Don't you dare sit there and think that you serve a God that just forgives your sin. You serve a God that forgets your sin. He don't hold receipts. Oh, you're guilty. I know you did it, but he don't even remember it. The Bible says, there's another scripture that says he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. I read one commentator, one commentary earlier this week that says, I got a lot of sins. God, protect the fish. He takes your sin and he throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. He takes your sin and he says, I don't remember it as far as the east is from the west. He takes your sin and he puts it on the goat and he sends it off into the wilderness. And I love this because the the God that doesn't remember my sins and the God that doesn't hold grudges, even though we do, the God that doesn't keep receipts on your sin is a God that loves you and doesn't care about the sin that you already repented of. I want to be clear here, though. Repentance is the key. Repentance is the key. Now, now, some of you in this room are going, yeah, I hear that, B, but you, you don't really know my sin. Because we all feel like that. Like, we got that one thing. In fact, I was talking to a young lady uh, a few weeks ago after I got done preaching, and she was asking me about it. I won't say the actual sin, but she was asking me about a specific sin. And she said, I really don't feel like God can forgive that. Can God forgive that sin? Is that somebody in the room? I know somebody in the room. I can feel it that you're sitting there going, I hear, but this doesn't, this doesn't apply to me because my sin is so great. Can I just point you to a few words in verse number 16 of the same chapter? Thus, he shall make an atonement in the holy place for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the people of Israel and because of their transgression. Here it is. All their sin. Did you read that? So verse 16 says, there's not a sin that Israel committed that isn't atoned for. That's the case in this room. There's not a sin that you committed. I don't care about that. If you came in here with your head down and you feel ashamed of it, you better pick your head up if you've repented of it and you've trusted in Jesus because that sin has been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. That sin has been put onto the goat and put sent into the wilderness. He forgives us. Y'all are making me work. I don't care. I I really don't. I don't know why I'm still on this point. I don't care what the sin is. I I don't. I think God's grace is greater than the sin. I think God's blood is not limited. I think the power of his blood can actually wash away every, not hyperbole, every single sin. I don't care if last night you 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 was popping edibles and burning sage while having an orgy. That sin, oh, I see, I had to go deep. I had to go deep there because y'all, y'all just looking at me. That sin, if it's repented of, can be forgiven and forgotten. So he says, I got two goats. One of them slices his throat, spread the blood. The other one. Put the sins on them. Send them away. What I love about Jesus is Jesus actually represents both goats. He's the sacrifice, right? He had bloodshed, but he's also the removal of your sins far as from the east is to the west. Jesus is our scapegoat. Remember the mercy seat we we learned about on Wednesday? I I told y'all that the mercy seat had two cherubims on each side. And and they kind of stood guard, right? They stood guard. Yo, you're in the presence of God. But these cherubims also had a New Testament meaning as well. Because when Jesus dies, the Bible says that the disciples go to Jesus' body. And John 20, verse 12, the Bible shows me that there were cherubims at at the tomb. But it specifically says that there was one at the head of Jesus and at the foot of Jesus. Does that not look like the mercy seat? This is why I say you don't got to go to the temple. You ain't got to sit there on Yom Kippur and wait for the sacrifice to be made. We can enter into the mercy of God by the person of Jesus because Jesus has replaced the mercy seat. We find mercy in Jesus. We find grace in Jesus. We find forgiveness in Jesus. Jesus is the goat. And I'm not talking about animals now. He's, He's really the greatest of all time. 
I know we argue about the goat. Y'all know I stand on it. Jesus is the real goat. That Jesus does what nobody else can do. Our sin is much worse than we can imagine. Nadab, Abihu, drop dead. But God's grace is greater than we ever dreamed of. Two goats, one sacrifice, one sent away for the people's sin. Finally, here's the question you should be asking. Okay, if it's Yom Kippur and I'm sitting there and the priest goes in on my behalf and puts my sin, you know, puts my sin away, what do I have to do? Right? Because we all, like, that's how I am too. What do we have to do? Like, give, give me the list. Give me the, I'll keep the, just give me the list of Christianity and I'll keep the list. You know, I found this earlier this week and it messed me up. I want to answer the question of what do you have to do, but I want to answer it in verse 29. This is what the people of Israel had to do. It says, and they show, uh, and they shall be a statue for you forever. And on the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves. Here it is. And you shall do no work. Wait, so what do I got to do? No work. But then, because that sounds like Sabbath. That sounds like rest to me. Well, let me show you the rest of it. Verse 30, for on this day uh, shall, a, shall an atonement be made for you to be cleansed, and you shall be cleansed, uh, uh, be cleansed before the Lord from all your sins. Here's Sabbath. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest. So the question you are asking is, I hear you. My sin is greater than I can imagine. I hear you that God's grace is greater than I can ever dream. What do I do with my sin? Trust in Jesus and do nothing else. That's rest. Now, I know we like busy work. I know we like busy work. Some of us get real bored. That's me, y'all. I got, I got undiagnosed ADHD, and I'm not joking about that. I cannot sit still. I come home, I want to do a bunch of things. My boy, my, my son is here, and, and Ty will tell you that when we sit down and watch a family movie, I'm going to get up at least 15 times, and seven of those times, I ain't got to use the bathroom or get nothing from the refrigerator. I just got to get up and walk for a second and come sit back down. They be like, because they pause it, because you, know, can't, you can't keep going and watch the movie. Like, you know, like I ain't watching it too. So I make them keep pausing it. It's because I don't know how to sit still. I like busy work. But please hear me and hear me well. There is no busy work in the kingdom. Jesus has already done the work. What do I have to do? Receive it by resting. Look at your neighbor and say, do nothing. This is how you know it's grace. You know it's grace when you sit there and go, that's it. It's grace. Because grace always makes you scratch your head going, I got to do more. Got to be my prayers. I got to come to church. I got to take communion. I got to get baptized. And we think all of these things. And at the core of it, the scripture says today that Israel received the, the, the Yom Kippur atonement by doing nothing but resting. And I want somebody today to walk out of here, trust in Jesus and rest. Rest where? Rest in him. He says, come to me, all you who are, who are weary and, 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 and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus says stuff like, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Rest. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, rest. You're working too much. And here's the thing about your work. Your, your work is subpar compared to what Jesus did. Jesus got a standing ovation. Oh, he, he killed the work. My, my, first, uh, my first concert I ever went to, um, it was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Pray for Will, and, <laughs> and Rob Bass. By the way, Matthias, in that first song, was that Rob Bass I heard in there? It wasn't in that track, no? I heard a little Rob. I thought I heard, that was just something was in my heart. So I was telling Matthias, I think that's Rob Bass. But anyway, Rob Bass, and this was Rob Bass when, it take, when, uh, when the song It Takes Two to Make a Things Go Right came out. Oh, it, are y'all young? Anybody 40 and up in here? A few of us, y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all feel me on this? My grandmother took me to the concert. She's from Harlem. Oh, man, my grandmother got up on the chair, took her shirt off. She was like, that's my grandma. Don't y'all talk about her. She took me to the concert. And, you know, what was dope about the concert was, the, no lie, the first opening, I mean, they dropped it. And this is when Parents Just Don't Understand came out. They dropped the first act that came out was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. They killed it. And then Rob Bass came right after them, killed it. And do you know, I don't know who the promoter was, do you know that they brought a local act that nobody knew after Rob Bass? I'm like, bro, everybody left. It was, it was, that, it was that, that whoever that group was, it was their family that stayed. 
everybody else left because after an encore and after we have seen the best, we don't need the rest. And some of y'all are trying to work out what Jesus has already perfected, what Jesus has already done, and yet you're still trying to pay for your sins by performance. You can't perform for God. Take off the gloves. Stop tap dancing before the Lord. Jesus has already done the work, so you don't have to. You know what my response is? I get to rest. He says, do no work. Here's my fear that some of you guys in this room, and I'm landing the plane. Play something soft here. I'm, I'm, my fear is that some of you in this room that don't know the Lord will die and go to hell, even though the pardon has been given to you today. There was a, a case in 1833. It was a case between United States and, and Wilson. It rose all the way up to this two centuries ago, it rose all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in this case, this guy named George Wilson, he was found guilty of several counts of robbery and the endangerment of the life of a, male, of a mailman driver. And apparently that was enough to get you put on death row. Apparently that, that, that was enough to get you executed. And so they, they already said his, his sentence. They said he would be executed. And then President Andrew Jackson said, I'm going to give him a pardon. He issued a pardon for George Wilson. And for reasons that we'll never know, George Wilson denied the pardon. Don't know why. He denied the pardon. So it rolls all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, we, we, can, we, you know, we can do something about this. But here's what the Supreme Court found out after they looked at all the legal ramifications around it. Here's what, here's what they said. A pardon is a contract, and a contract is not complete unless both sides ratify it. If it is rejected by one side, we have no power in this court to force it on him. Do you know, that was 1833. Do you know the next year in 1834 that George Wilson died with a pardon on the warden's desk? Here's my fear. That Jesus has paid for your sins and you have a pardon and you will die and go to hell with it on the warden's desk. Now I know you're sitting here going, oh, Pastor, we don't do this hell talk. I told y'all before, I used to get a hell sermon every other week when I was a kid. They, they scared us. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm really not. I've told y'all before, the worst part of hell is not the gnashing of teeth, teeth and the unquenchable fire. The worst part of hell is being separated from Jesus forever. That's the, that's the fear I got in my heart. That I would be separated from a good God forever. And some of you that don't know Jesus... Don't allow this pardon that is given to you to sit on the desk. You should do something about it. And once you've accepted Jesus, there's no more work for you to do. There's nothing. You, nothing. There's nothing else you can do to add to your salvation. The only thing you bring to salvation is the sin that makes salvation even necessary. That's all you come to the Lord with is a bag of sin. Jesus takes the bag, puts it on himself, and gives you a clean bag with nothing in it. This is the gospel. And many of us are walking away, and we're rejecting it, and we're living life any old way that we want to, and, and we're, not, we're justifying sin and calling it, it's not that bad. Did you read what happened to a bayou? Did you read what happened to Nadab? Every head bow and every eye closed. I want to pray for somebody. As far as it depends on me, I refuse for anybody to go to hell. You're guilty, but you're not too guilty to be forgiven. Your sins are great, but your sins aren't so great that they can't be washed. The Bible says that he washes us whiter than snow. And all you have to do today is receive it. Our sin is great. God's grace is greater. And the response to that it's just acceptance. I don't know who it is in this room. We had two people, y'all, two people in the first service that heard the gospel and say, I refuse to die and for my own sins when Jesus has already done them and then gave their life to the Lord. And I'm just curious, is there anybody in this room that would say, that's me? I, I know I'm not. I know that I'm not living under the lordship of Jesus. I've never professed faith. I'm not walking in his ways. Some of it I don't even fully understand. If that is you in this room, just do me a favor. Just raise your hand because we want to help you to walk from death to life. 
the gospel is freeing, that the gospel is true, that the gospel is real, that Jesus actually does love you, that your sin is not too great, that Jesus can forgive us. I see that hand. Hallelujah. See that hand. I'm going to give it another second. I, think, I don't think we understand God's wrath against our sin. God hates it. In fact, Isaiah 53 verse 10 said, it pleased the father to crush the son. It ple- how, how does it please you to crush your son? Because it's the one thing that signs the pardon for you to be welcomed forever into heaven. Is there somebody else who wants to give their life to the Lord? I saw that hand. After service, if you could see Yolanda, raise your hand, Yolanda, over here, because we'd love to talk to you a little bit more about this profession. Father, I pray for this room. I pray for every single individual. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us out of somewhat of a a random book like Leviticus. Yet, Lord, it it is your holiness we see in Leviticus. It is our brokenness that we see in Leviticus. But ultimately, Lord, it is your grace that we see in the book of Leviticus. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, that as we contemplate and grapple with our dysfunction, I also pray, oh God, that we would also rejoice in your forgiveness, that you love us and have made a way for us to be forgiven, that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. No longer do we need to look to the high priest, but we have a great high priest in Jesus, and we thank you. It's in his name, in his name alone we give glory. Can we just worship Jesus in this room for a second, y'all? Come on, just for a second. I know we got to go, just for a second. Thank you, Lord. Communion is coming around. This is a time we get to celebrate. And I always like to use the word celebrate. We don't mourn the death of Christ. We celebrate the death of Christ because it is our scapegoat. And if you've trusted in Jesus, we ask that you would take one of these. Once you get it, do me a favor, stand to your feet and we're going to worship Jesus together.